Hi, I'm Frank, and I'm talking about Optane SSDs and how they make Scylla sing. Hello, everybody. I'm Thomas Sander. I'm Frank Ober. Frank Ober. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about the uh, Intel Optane SSD and Scylla and how together they provide uh, the speed of an in-memory database, but with an important thing called persistency. So this is us. Uh, we're both solution architect, but from different companies. And uh, I don't have much to say more about it. You want to say something about yourself? No? OK. No, we're good. We're cool. We don't have a lot of time, do we, Tomer? Let's go. Yeah. Y'all took like half of our time. Anyhow, uh, this one we're gonna, we were gonna talk today. Uh, uh, Mark is gonna, uh, Frank, sorry, is gonna talk about the, the uh, Intel Optane and in details, which he knows best. And I'm gonna talk about Scylla as an in-memory solution and how we knew that, if, that Optane is gonna rock and the testing that we did on that and the performance testing, the setup, the workloads we used, and of course, the interesting thing, the results, and the TCO and why it's so good. So the challenge is providing a solution uh, with the performance of an in-memory like database, but without compromise on the throughput, latency, and of course, data persistency. The way we did that is by combining Scylla with Optane and all the good stuff that Scylla brings in and how it knows how to utilize great uh, disks uh, to resolve the call cache and the data persistency challenges. And here's Mark. Thank here's you. Frank. Thank Sorry. you, Tomer. So I just want to give you a little primer on Optane SSDs because they're fundamentally very different from other NAND-based SSDs. All the SSDs in the market today use NAND. This is the first time there's been a resistive RAM uh, memory that's been built, first new memory in 25 years. And so we coin it the most um, responsive SSD in the world. Why? Because without any Q depth whatsoever and just with a single thread, be it at sync or with libAIO, you get 100,000 IOPS, right? You will not get that on a standard NAND-based SSD. It'll be somewhere more like 10,000, 20,000. Because a little trick between our data sheets and what's actually happening is that you have to load these queues across many jobs to actually get the performance out of a NAND-based SSD. You have to push the NAND. And fundamentally, this memory pushes back into the CPU and actually uh, completely saturates uh, many of our pearly cores with just one device, right? I use MySQL, 36 threads on a highly optimized my.conf, and one Optane uh, is at 70% busy, and all of the CPUs are saturated. There's typically 100 active threads on 36 cores. So that's MySQL, right? Pretty much standard database. Uh, Optane SSDs, this is what you care about, right? You want to look for the throughput against Scylla DB and see how much you can actually push these devices. You should get very low Q depth and into the gigabytes per second. And as Tomer's gonna show you, you're actually gonna be able to sustain below one millisecond on your read access uh, through the database, right? Through, through a lot of code uh, with a device like this. I had a peer of Scylla say to a customer from the financials that said, this is a device that truly is sub one millisecond. We don't see any NAND devices on our database architecture being truly sub one millisecond. And you're gonna see the same thing here. Um, latency is the number one thing. The talk earlier today on latency was perfect. That's the thing we stress the most about. And it's not average latency. You can obviously uh, look at your average latency number, but you're missing something there. You wanna look at the quality of service of the latency and how the five nines are, in, a, in an SSD, we look at five and seven nines. In your software, you look at 95th, 99th, three nines. And then, of course, people ask, is it as good as DRAM and it never wears out? The, this type of memory will eventually wear out, but you're gonna see a slide here in a second where um, we show you where, how it compares to NAND-based SSDs. So here's the graph of using FIO. FIO is a torture, torture tool for, uh, uh, for devices. It runs on Linux. Flexible I.O. tester is what it stands for. And as you can see, the Optane SSD uh, saturates at a Q depth of eight. Uh, we kind of designed it that way. We had done studies with a number of companies, including our own IT division at Intel, and found that no server was running its I.O. devices more than eight, right? And in fact, do you want to be at eight? No, you want to be at one. So you have the consistency, right? Because queues and filling queues is not a benefit to the consistency of Scylla, right? You want to be able to have basically no queue depth and maximum throughput, 
right? And that's what we designed this for. Here's uh, a nice little, remember scatter plots from when you were in college? They're still valuable, right? Scatter plots are still valuable. And where are they valuable? On all the different I.O. measurements that we get from a NAND-based SSD. This is, you know, only talking about ourselves here. We try not to ever talk about the competition. This is our best NAND SSD that we ever built, uh, the P3700. There's like 50% extra NAND in there just to try and make the damn thing consistent, right? That's what we do. We put so much extra NAND in these things. It's called over-provisioning, the adding, adding NAND. You can do it yourself. You can curtail uh, SSD size, uh, two terabyte. You can make it a one terabyte drive, and then the firmware is smart enough to say, oh, I've got all this extra NAND to play with. Let me see if I can get more consistent. But all of this sounds like a Band-Aid, and it is. Uh, fundamentally, you just need better memory. And here's average lead and write latency, right? Most of the tests you'll see from us is where we do a lot of writes as well as reads, right? If it's a 100% read-oriented workload, I myself, being from Intel, would say, Optane may not be the best thing for you if, unless you completely care about just the better latency and better tail latency, right? But once you start mixing in the writes, that's where a NAND SSD all of a sudden magically slows down. We don't because it's fundamentally different memory, right? And that's the key thing, right? So most of us know about workloads. They tend to be bursty, right? If you've got a, a website, there are certain days of the year that that website gets extra active, especially if it's retailing. And there's something called, you know, a, a large flood of, of users, or what we like to call write pressure, when there's just a lot of data coming in. And this SSD will not falter as you write pressure it. So you can imagine the guys that build storage area networks, the EMCs, the three parts of the world are absolutely thrilled uh, with this type of memory sitting in the front of their devices because they can take that write pressure like no other device on the planet can. And finally, the endurance. Uh, endurance is at 30 right now. So what does 30 mean? It's the amount of drive writes per day, or sometimes you see us uh, vendors talk about total petabytes that you can write to either a NAND SSD or an Optane SSD. Like I said, this doesn't last forever, but it lasts infinitely more. Think about this. We're actually building dim quality 3D crosspoint now. What do we mean by dim quality? Millions of write cycles capability, millions. Right? Just to give you some reference point, a NAND a cell can take about 30,000. That's just a number I'm throwing out there. Tens of thousands versus millions of cycles that it can handle, right? And so that's the key thing is that this memory is fundamentally far more endurant. And you're going to see uh, with the new devices we're coming out, you're going to have a much higher number than this. So, you know, it's just a matter of testing. You know, could, a lot of times our executives get asked, you know, could you go higher? We could, but it's expensive to test. So that answers that. And I'll, I'm here after the show to help you uh, understand the technology a little better. Thanks, Frank. So let's talk a bit about uh, Scylla as an in-memory solution. So uh, what are our, what's the in-memory database uh, requirement? So we want it to be, we want a, a fast, feed, fa fast speed to handle millions of operations and handle large number of clients. And we want, of course, our latencies to be DRAM speed. What are the challenges? The challenges for us are uh, persistency and cold cache scalability and simplicity of data models. Persistency and uh, high availability, so cold cache. When, when we have a cold cache, the disk -like, we have a disk-like uh, performance, which this type of uh, uh, databases, the in-memory ones, typically underperform. Uh, when uh, regarding high availability, when we get a server down, transaction may not be recorded. And eventually for scalability uh, challenge, uh, the amount of data you can keep is the size of the RAM size, which is typically much smaller than your data set. Um, the simplistic data model. So in-memory databases typically uses uh, a simple uh, key value data model and are not intended for complex ones. So Scylla basically provides a solution for all these challenges. It provides persistent data storage and high throughput and rich data model capabilities. And Scylla basically scales and scales and scales, and that's great. 
And what Scylla needs is a very fast storage to pair with. So that made us more than happy to test the drive, the Optane uh, drive, and see how fast we can push Scylla. And as of for ease of fetching, Scylla and Optane gives you a great solution for reads both from memory and disk, while in memory will suffer on cache misses. So how we knew Optane is gonna rock? We use Displorer, it was uh, mentioned in uh, the several of the lectures earlier, uh, to measure the disk capabilities. Uh, Displorer is a small wrapper around the FIO used to graph the relationship between concurrency, throughput, and IOPS. The concurrency is the number of parallel operations that we can uh, uh, push the disk, uh, and while increasing the concurrency, the latency increases. What we want to find uh, is the sweet spot, as mentioned, or what we called the knee. And as we push more and more uh, IOPS, we can see the latency goes up. And at some point, we don't get much more uh, IOPS into the disk, but the latency goes up and up, marked with the arrows. Here we can see a, a, re a random read test of a 4K buffer. And these are the results we got, a 1 million throughput and a latency of 18 uh, microseconds. So what's the setup and workload we used to, to test the Optane? We used three Scylla uh, servers with version two uh, release candidate, uh, three clients, you can see the specs here, and uh, one tweak that we did. We tweaked the, uh, IOCOF, the IO, IOCONF, and why we did that, when we started testing, we saw that the CPU responsible for the I.O. were overwhelmed because the disk is so damn fast and our uh, auto-tune uh, uh, auto -tune values there wasn't exactly fitting. So for a disk this fast, we decided we could do much better by uh, tweaking the I.O. scheduler configuration and favor having one queue per shard, even if, if, even if that means disrespecting the optimal concurrency. So we set the number of IOs to be uh, equal to the number of shards. I should mention that future versions of Scylla will have more IO scheduler enhancement to better handle this kind of cases and there will be no need for uh, this tweaking. So we use Cassandra Stress with a user-defined mode and that allows us to test various uh, data models and, and uh, that's very easy to use and create your uh, various data models. We use the simple key value schema and we use that to populate 50% uh, of the storage capacity. We used all of the server's RAM, which we had 128 uh, gigabytes, a replication factor set, of, uh, set to three and the consistency level set to one. We tested uh, various workloads. Uh, we did that to challenge the default 512 uh, byte sector size and we wanted to see how, what's the maximum IOPS we can push uh, in, in each of these payloads at a, very at a very low latency numbers for the reads. We tested two read scenarios. We tested a read scenario when, where uh, the uh, large working set is much larger, larger than the RAM size. In this scenario, uh, the, the probability to find some, uh, some of the data you're reading in Scylla's cache is very uh, uh, low. The other, uh, the other scenario was uh, the opposite when we want to read almost everything or everything from the cache. Uh, and the latency measurement. Uh, we use the Cassandra Stress end-to-end -end latency results that it gives you. And we also use the Scylla server-side latency result uh, using our no tool table histogram command. We use that for the reads. Uh, as, uh, as the writes one uh, are not uh, pretty much accurate and we have a bug on that and we know that it needs to be fixed. So, interesting thing, the results. You can see here the table for the 1K and the 5K, and you can see the latencies are extremely, extremely, extremely low. The Cassandra stress ones, and also the Scylla server ones. Uh, the latencies in the Scylla server side the, for the reads are below half a millisecond. And it was that throughout the various payload we used, we got, of course, a, a, a different number for the total request that uh, uh, we got uh, per the payload. And uh, what is interesting here is that for the, the read scenarios, which I just mentioned, you can see that the read, read the large spread 
uh, got us reads about 75% from the disk, and the read small spread got us everything from in-memory. And of course, you can see that reflecting in the results. These are the results for the 10 uh, kilobytes payload. Again, under a half a millisecond uh, latency side on the Scylla server side, and great result also for the end-to-end -end, all the way from the client in the Cassandra stress. Then we went and tested the throughput. Here we wanted to push the drives and see just how much throughput we can get and pay a led, less attention to the latency. So we used a very small payload, 125 bytes. We changed the replication factor and consistency level to one. And we used much more Cassandra stress clients to push as much as we can. For the uh, latency test, we used only uh, three Cassandra stress uh, instances. So in this, this time we, de we did the, the read large spread uh, twice. We did it for the entire uh, population, which was 600 million partitions, and we also did it for half of it. And you can see the results here. Uh, the results for the read from the in-memory got us over 2 million IOPS, and the uh, read of the 300 million partition, large spread, 50% from disk, got us uh, uh, nearly a million in an average with top speed, top IOPS of uh, 135 million. Here you can see a graph of the read from uh, in memory, which we, you can see we are very stable on the two million, as you can see that on the graph. The TCO, so Intel Optane provides great latency results and it's more than just the results, it's comes down to 50% cheaper compared to DRAM or enterprise SSD configuration. We can see the numbers. These uh, details were taken around uh, June, so the numbers may be very, but very little. The Intel Optane is around $1,500, and using this calculation, we can see that using two uh, Intel Optanes with a 128 gigabyte RAM server uh, gives us a price of $4,200, which is less than half what you would get that with an enterprise SSD. So that's very, that's very good. And as every new uh, um, technology comes in, especially in, in disks, uh, price usually goes down over time. So it's already a very competitive price. So what did we learn? We learned that Scylla's uh, C++ uh, scaling architecture allows us to get very high throughput and very low latency. Uh, in these workloads. We saw that Intel Optane and Scylla achieves the performance of uh, an all in-memory database, and that Scylla resolves the cold cache and data persistency challenges, and we did not compromise, not on the throughput, and the latency and performance were kept great. Uh, Scylla gives you data that resides on a non-volatile storage, again, comparing to um, in-memory database. And the Scylla server 95% result were under half a milliseconds at 165 requests per second or more. And the TCO is 50% cheaper, so that's extremely great. We thank you very much. We have now five minutes for questions, and we encourage you also to check our blogs that we published, and you can also, of course, contact us. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so there was the, if you, if you can see on the right side of the results, I, I presented the, the load that we had. If I could just, oh, yeah. if you can just load it for a second, yeah, I'll go back. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, load on the server. Yeah, you yeah. see, uh, load per server, we didn't even get to 100%. That's CPU utilization, right? The the That's the reactor. That, that's, the, that's, the that's the reactor, that's the Scylla reactor load. Scylla reactor. Scylla reactor load. So as you can see, we didn't even get to 100%, but uh, again, these are the best. What that would mean, it was in the sense of the IOUT, so the disk was already working at full capacity. You just don't know if these numbers for the disk are the limit, or? Uh, well, you, use, well or using, it, using it with Scylla, that's the best we can do. But uh, when we used it with the, uh, with the Displorer, Mm -hmm. Sorry, 
you can see here a bit, one million IOPS and a latency of 18 microseconds, and the concurrency was around 24. So that's, that, this one pushed the disk to, to the limit. Uh, so I'm trying to think back. It was done like a, a few months ago. Um, if I remember correctly, um, we, I don't think we got, well, in the, in the 1K, you can basically add uh, around a 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 to the numbers you see here, and that was the, the largest, I think. So from, from the 1K, the largest was about 1.1, 1.2, and for the 5K, it was a, you can increment. So it's about uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. That was the highest numbers. Yeah. Have you considered doing a similar type of experiment with the uh, virtual RAID on CPU? Virtual RAID on CPU. VROC. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't uh, have a no, VROC-based server. No, we don't. We didn't. Do, we, we didn't have that. So yeah, Intel, Intel that. provided the hardware. We got six. What here? Well, we, well our ex. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we recommend RAID zero for these devices, right? And these these environments are replicated. So, I mean, the one's uh, weak spot for VROC is RAID five, as you would expect, right? So, you know, I can't extrapolate on this environment. I mean, one thing I should add, I should have had a, a slide on it, is you want to push your user percentage time on your CPU as high as you possibly can. Keep your system overhead low, way under 20% under preferably. And I await, right? So we have a tool called Storage Snapshot. You can Google Intel Storage Snapshot. It's completely free. What it does is it provides you a graphical representation in HTML5 of you know, a bunch of statistics from IOSTAT and so forth. It's DSTAT, actually. We, we, use a DSTAT script, and we pull all the DSTAT statistics off Linux and give you a nice visual representation. If you've got I.O. weight in your system, you're wasting your money. Your CPUs are expensive. Your CPUs drive your throughput. You should be maximizing your CPUs and, of course, queuing them as well. So, you know, that's the one thing for those of you that are still, you know, learning about maximizing the performance on your system. When, when I run these, my own tests, I.O. weight is zero with Octane. I'm always saturating CPUs on all NoSQL databases. I wasn't involved in this, these guys did it, but I always saturate my cores. Of course, you could start adding hundreds of cores on a system and eventually my Optanes will start you know, screaming that they're the problem. It's a balance. Yep, 30 seconds, any last <coughs> question? Okay, thank you very much.